All right, so we have a uh, clarinet player walking away from you at a speed of five meters per second. And we know he's playing a note with this frequency, 277 hertz. And we want to know what frequency you actually hear from that. So how can we figure out the change in the, the new frequency here? Or first of all, why would we hear a different frequency than just 277 hertz again? Why wouldn't you just hear the 277 hertz that he's playing? Is that because um, he's moving? Yeah, he's moving. So we're going to get a Doppler shift, uh, specifically this moving source. There we go. So the source is moving. So we have a Doppler effect. And what equation could we use to figure out the observed frequency FO based on the source frequency? How does that get modified? What's the modifier that changes the source frequency into the observed frequency? Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, is it velocity? Uh, yeah, it's going to involve velocity, specifically speed of sound, plus or minus what? Um, is it the initial velocity? Well, there's no, there's not really any changes in velocity, so there's no initial and final here. There's just the speed at which the source is moving, and the speed at which the observer is moving. So which one goes? Oh yeah. Okay. Um. So then, when you have like v plus or minus one, or I guess nothing over v plus or minus the velocity of the source. Uh yes. Yeah, is the is the observer on the numerator? Um. Yeah. On something that I have in my notes, it's observer in the numerator and source in the denominator. Okay. And yeah, in this case, the observer is not moving because you're listening to the music while just sitting on a bench. So in this context, uh, in this case, the observer is zero because you're not moving. <clears throat> uh, what about speed of the source? How fast is the clarinet player moving? Five meters per second. Yeah, five meters per second. I guess I should include units here, zero meters per second. And then we know that the frequency of the source is uh, 277 hertz. That's the, the note that he's playing. And we wanna know what's the frequency you hear, frequency of the observer, or frequency that is observed. And that's everything we need here, except for uh, what's V in this equation? What does just plain V represent here? Is that just speed of sound? Yeah, or more generally, the speed of whatever wave we're talking about, which is in this case, sound. And what is the usual speed of sound in air? I'm pretty sure it's 340 meters per second. Yeah, about 340. I think it's closer to more like 344, but does this problem tell us which speed of sound to use? Um, let me see. I think it's probably at the top. Uh, yeah, they said 340. Okay, so let's go ahead and use 340 then. <clears throat> in that case, we can fill in everything we have so far into the Doppler shift equation. We know uh, the frequency of the source, 277. And speed of sound, 340. 
and speed of the observer is zero, so that can just be dropped out entirely. And the speed of the source, five meters per second. Which also means we do still need to decide whether this is plus or minus. And the way I usually think about that is uh, if, the, if the source is moving away from you, you're listening to a sound of somebody who's moving further and further away. Should you expect that to create a higher pitch sound or a lower pitch sound? Lower, right? Yeah. If the source is moving away from you, the waves get more spread out because the person emits a wavelength and then he moves and emits another wavelength. That second wavelength is now further than it should be from the first wavelength. Wavelengths further apart means a longer wavelength, but a smaller frequency. They're hitting you, the waves are hitting your ears less frequently. Source is moving away from you. This creates a lower frequency. So that means, should we be, we, we want the result to be lower. Should we be using plus or minus in the denominator? Plus. Yeah. Uh, plus in the denominator would create a larger denominator, which makes the result smaller. Because a larger denominator makes for a smaller result. So we'll use plus. So that means frequency observed is going to be 277 hertz times 340 over 340 plus 5 would be 345. And the meters per second cancels out anyway, because that's an enumerator and denominator. So 340 over 345 is about 99, 98.5% times 277 is pretty close to 273. So that's the note you would hear. Instead of hearing the 277 hertz that's actually being produced, you're gonna hear a slightly no, slightly lower note. Wait, let's, let's stop. 273, 273 hertz is the note you would actually hear. Any questions on that? Um, I don't think so. I think that makes a lot more sense with, because I always feel like I messed up the plus or minus part. Yeah, that can be tricky. There, there's some rules you can memorize for when it should be plus and when it should be minus, but I always forget those anyway. So I usually just look at it in these terms. And based on the direction of motion, should I expect that to create a higher or lower pitch sound? And to create that higher or lower result, should I be using plus or minus in the numerator versus the denominator? So think it through in terms of which one is going to make it larger or smaller as you expect and choose plus or minus based on that. So, um, can you sort of try to think of an example, I guess, of when, because sometimes you could have the observer and the source moving, right? So if they're moving mm -hmm. in the same direction. Yeah, like let's say you get up and start uh, following the clarinet player. Uh, let's say, let me switch this to a different color. Suppose you then start walking towards the clarinet player at, let's say, let's say six meters per second, you wanna catch up. So you walk a little faster. In that case, we'd still have the plus five meters per second in the denominator because the clarinet player is still moving away from you. But we'd also have a uh, frequent, uh, sorry, velocity of the observer, six meters per second. And for that, you're walking towards the clarinet player. Ignoring the clarinet player's own motion, if you're walking towards the source, would you expect to hear a higher or lower frequency? I guess um, you would hear higher. Yeah. If you're walking towards the source, you've got uh, waves coming towards you at a certain rate. If you're walking towards the source, you're gonna be intercepting more of those waves per second because you're walking into them. <clears throat> so this should create a higher frequency. And if you want the result to be higher and you're able to manipulate the numerator, should you, you, should you uh, use plus or minus in the numerator to get a higher result? Plus. Yeah. So we'll use plus in the numerator. 
So 340 plus six over 340 plus five, that'll be 277 Hertz times 346 over 345. The units cancel out again. <clears throat> so that'll be just a little tiny bit more than 277. 346 over 345. Yeah, 277.8. So it hardly changes. So this will be the frequency you hear if you get up and start walking after the clarinet player. Any other questions on that one? Um, I think that makes sense. So then you would subtract if um, they were moving towards you because you're getting a higher. Yeah. yeah, if the source is moving towards you, then you do subtraction in the numerator. Or if you're moving away from the source, you'd use subtraction in the, in the numerator. Okay. So, and, and again, uh, trying to memorize rules like that often leads to forgetting, forgetting them anyway. So I would generally recommend thinking it through like this, figure out based on the motion, should you expect higher or lower frequency and then choose the plus or minus that will result in that happening. <clears throat> okay, that makes sense. Um, oh, and I don't know if uh, you have time to go over part B of this too, but this was just um, looking at the, uh, harmonic uh, Yeah, let's take a look at that as well. Sketch the second harmonic, uh, all the holes closed, and this is an open closed pipe. Okay, so let's take a look at that pipe. And uh, since this is open on one end and closed on the other end, Let's just draw that out. Open on one end, close on the other end. So something like that. And what does that tell us about the ends? If one end is open and one end is closed, what kind of points on the standing wave do we have to have at those points? Um, the node, I think it'd start with a node and then it would um, open up into an anti-node. Yeah, and we can actually go either way depending on what type of wave we're considering this to be. Because a sound wave you can treat as uh, oscillations in pressure. Like this location of air is going from high pressure to low pressure to high pressure to low pressure. Or you could think of it as oscillations in the displacement of the air molecules. You'd say this air molecule is wiggling back and forth. You know, like air molecules getting close together, further apart, close together, further apart. <clears throat> so depending on how we want to write that, uh, you could actually use a node or an antinode for each end. But the important thing in the long run is that they're opposite types of points. Uh, so let's say we're treating this as, do you want to treat this as the pressure of the air or the location of the molecules? That is a pressure wave or a displacement wave. Wait, sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, the, the sound wave can be treated as oscillations in the pressure of the air or oscillations in the location of the air molecules. They'll both lead to the same overall result. It's just a difference in how we draw it. So do you wanna treat the sound wave as oscillations in pressure or oscillations in location of the molecules? Oh, that makes sense. Um, I guess in terms of pressure. Okay, if we look at this as a pressure wave, let me make a note of that so we know for later. Sound as a pressure wave. So pressure can change from high pressure to low pressure. If we're talking about this open end, that's exposed to the air around it. So what do you know about the pressure at that exposed end? Uh, that it's the same as the atmospheric pressure. Yeah, just like in 7b, any location exposed to the air around it, just an open part of the container, that has to be at one atmosphere. So this end is, this end must be at atmospheric pressure, which means that cannot oscillate its pressure. Its pressure cannot change significantly. 
So if the pressure at that point cannot change, should that be considered to be a node or an antinode? I think a no. Yeah, because an antinode is oscillating wildly. A node is not oscillating at all. So we would consider that point to be a pressure node, no oscillation. If you look at this in terms of motion, the molecules at that point are moving wildly, but they're at, at a constant pressure. <coughs> if you look at the other end though, the closed end, <coughs> one moment. Uh, if you look at the other end that's got this wall in the way, the wall can counteract any amount of changes in pressure. The air can be pushing on the wall, pulling on the wall. So the location with the wall could be at any pressure. That means the pressure can oscillate. So what type of point is that? An antinode. Yeah. Pressure antinode. Now, if we were doing this in terms of displacement, the wall would be a node because the air can't move because the wall is in the way. But in terms of pressure, it's an antinode because the wall can push back with any amount of pressure. So we would consider that to be an antinode in the sense that the pressure can oscillate a great deal here. <clears throat> so that's what we know here. We know that the wall, in terms of a pressure wave, sound is a pressure wave, the closed end, the wall, is an antinode, and the open end is a node. The simplest standing wave we could draw with that is just that antinode and that node, and that's it. So the standing wave would look like this. We'd have essentially a fourth of a wavelength equal to the length of the pipe. But that's the first harmonic. We want the second harmonic, so what should we do differently here? What um, else would we need? I think you would have another node um, mm -hmm. in between. Yeah. And nodes and antinodes come in pairs. So we're going to have to put it in another node and another antinode. Evenly spaced. So a node a third of the way along and another antinode another third of the way along. Something like that. So we'd be going from antinode to node to antinode to node. So that is what the second harmonic is gonna look like. You're gonna have a couple of regions where the pressure is oscillating wildly and a couple of locations, including the end, the open end, where the pressure is staying relatively constant. And if we wanted to figure out the wavelength there, a very useful way to look at this is to split this up based on quarter wavelengths. A quarter wavelength takes you from where to where. Like if you were, let's say, at a crest on a wave and you go a quarter wavelength forward, what kind of point are you now at? Um, I think you're at, so I guess in this case, if you went from the top, a quarter wavelength, you would be at the node then? Yeah, the quarter wavelength takes you from crest to equilibrium or equilibrium to the next trough or trough to the next equilibrium. In this case, it would take you from an anti-node to a node. So this is one quarter wavelength. <clears throat> and then from node to the next antinode, that's another quarter wavelength. And then from antinode to the next node, that's another quarter wavelength. So it looks like we can split this up as the length of the pipe equaling three quarter wavelengths. So if we write that out as an equation, uh, one second, I look like. Uh, we can say that the length of the pipe, let's say L, equals three quarter wavelengths. And this is a very useful way to split it up because a quarter wavelength takes you from a node to an antinode, from a point to the opposite type of point. So if we start and end at opposite types of points, we've got to have an odd number of quarter wavelengths. Like if we had one more quarter wavelength, we'd start and end at an antinode, and that's the wrong type of standing wave. So this has to start and end at opposite types of points, meaning we need an odd number of quarter wavelengths. In this case, three quarter wavelengths. 
solve that for lambda n, what do you get? <clears throat> Um, you get, or I guess you have four uh, L over three. Yeah. So this would be the wavelength then. <coughs> if we knew the length of the pipe, uh, we could multiply by four, divide by three. That would tell us the wavelength of the second harmonic. Or alternatively, if we knew the wavelength, we could then solve for L, figure out how long does the clarinet have to be to make this happen. Uh, also, if you wanted to convert this to frequency to find what pitch you actually hear, what else would you have to do? Um, you could have, since velocity equals um, frequency times wavelength, you mm -hmm. could plug that in. Yeah, speed equals wavelength times frequency. <coughs> so divide both sides by wavelength. And we can say speed divided by four L over three. In other words, speed times the reciprocal three over four L. So that will be the frequency, speed of sound in air because the, the sound, sound wave is in air when it's being produced. So that's speed of sound in the air inside the pipe times three divided by four times the length of the pipe. That'll tell you the frequency in Hertz of the sound that's being produced. Any other questions on that? Um, wait, sorry, why did you flip? Oh, never mind. Okay, I see mm. now. Yeah, we're dividing by the wavelength, so that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. Yeah, that makes sense. And more generally, for any situation like this, it doesn't have to be uh, three half quarter wavelengths. It could be any odd number of quarter wavelengths. So more generally, wavelength is gonna be four times the length of the pipe divided by some odd number. Specifically the nth odd number. So like this is the second harmonic, so we're using the second odd number, which is three. If we were looking at like the fifth harmonic, we'd look for the fifth odd number. <clears throat> and you can be more specific about that by using an odd number as two n minus one. 2n minus one will give you the nth odd number. Like for instance, in this case, you plug in two, you get two times two minus one, that's three. And then to convert to a frequency, <coughs> it's still speed divided by wavelength. So we'd have speed times the reciprocal odd over four L. So this is a, a general formula for frequencies as <clears throat> frequencies of standing waves in an open closed pipe. Speed of, speed of the wave in that material, in this case, speed of sound in air, times an odd number, the nth odd number, divided by four times the length. And this is true not only for a pipe, but also for, like, let's say you take a, a metal bar that's fixed at one end, but free to rotate on, free to vibrate on the other, and you pluck it to get a twanging sound like from a thumb piano, for instance, that's gonna create the same sort of standing waves, nodes on one side, anti-nodes on the other side. So it's gonna follow the exact same pattern, same, same formulas and everything. The only difference is that V in, the, in that case would be the speed of the wave in the metal instead of the speed of sound in air. It's just the speed of the wave in whatever medium it's being produced in. Any other questions on that one or standing waves in general? Um, I don't think so. So in this case, we looked at sound as a pressure wave. Um, what did you say mm -hmm. the other the other option would be? Uh, sound as a displacement wave, and that's going to be very similar. If we <clears throat> if we think of the sound as a display as a displacement wave, instead, displacement means we're talking about uh, the motion of the air molecules. So in that case, the wall would be a displacement node because the sound, the, the air molecules can't move very far because the wall's in the way. And then the open end would be an anti-node because the air is more free to move. The air molecules can move around. And then to get the n equals two case, we'd still want to alternate node, anti-node, node, anti-node. 
we throw in the extra node antinode pair as the second harmonic. But then what the wave would look like would be something like this, node to antinode, node to antinode to node to antinode. And we still have three quarter wavelengths. So regardless of whether you draw it as a pressure wave or a displacement wave, that's gonna flip which ones you're calling nodes and which ones you're calling antinodes. But you still get the same overall pattern and you still get the same equation. So this equation we just got, or these two equations, one for wavelength, one for frequency, these work for any situation where the two endpoints are opposite types of points, regardless of whether you're calling them nodes or antinodes. The important thing is they're opposite types of points. <clears throat> Any other questions on that? Um, I don't think so. I'm good. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, let's take a look at this other practice quiz then. Pull that up. Uh, with some lenses. Screen. <clears throat> Uh, so what are you trying to figure out in this one? What's going on here? Could you uh, go over specifically number two? Uh, number two. Okay. Didn't realize there were more. Uh, so it looks like we have a uh, square with positive charges at points B and C. So we have charges at locations B and C. And we want to create another charge at point D that makes the voltage at point A zero. Uh, let me clear this off a little bit. Let's take it some space to work with. So we have uh, two big positive charges at location B, location C. We have the option of putting a charge at location D. So let me call that uh, just QD for now. And we don't know what that is. But we do know we wanna make sure that the voltage at location A is zero. That is the voltage from all the other charges combined. And we get to choose what charge to put at location D to make that happen. Also, we're assuming that all of the side lengths of the square are one meter. It doesn't really matter that they're one meter, actually. The important thing is just that they're all the same distance, but it does tell us we can treat it as one meter. So we wanna figure out the voltage, or we want the voltage at location A to be zero. Since all the points, all the charges we care about are single points, what formula could we use for voltage here? Is it the, uh, the V equals QK over R? Yeah, that should work. <clears throat> the universal constant K times the charge divided by the distance R. So for instance, we could figure out the, the voltage caused by, locate, by charge B at location A, the voltage caused by charge C at location A, and also using QD as an unknown, the voltage caused by charge D at location A. So we've got voltage B at A is K times plus Q, divided by the distance, one meter. And then we can do the same thing for C. It's also charge plus Q and it's also one meter away. So the voltage caused by charge C at location A is K times plus Q divided by one meter. So they're both, both producing the same amount of voltage. 
how would we figure out the total voltage of both of those together? Uh, we add them. Yeah, we can just add those up. We get two KQ over one meter. Uh, which is definitely not zero. So we're going to need to put in some extra charge at location D to balance that out. So let's say voltage from D at A equals K times, we don't know the charge at D, so we'll just write that as QD divided by, and what's the distance there? How far is charge D from the point we care about. Uh, if you use the Pythagorean theorem, it should be radical too. Yeah, because we've got one meter, one meter, square both of those add them together, take the square root. And yes, we get square root of two meters. So fill that in. And now we can just say all three of these added together, we want to cancel out. We want to get the total voltage being zero. We want zero volts at location A. So let's add those up. KQ over one meter plus KQ over one meter plus K times the unknown QD divided by square root of two meters has to add up to zero. And before we start rearranging things algebraically, are there any multipliers or divisors that we can get rid of that show up in everything? Uh, the K and the Q? Yeah, I, well, I wouldn't get rid of Q because Q, the capital Q doesn't show up in every term. Specifically, it doesn't show up in this term. Yeah, but definitely. Yeah, definitely K shows up in every term. So we can divide both sides by K and cancel that out. And then on the other side, zero divided by K is still just zero. Also, it looks like every denominator has meters in it. So let's multiply both sides by meters. Then we don't have to worry about these extra units. So simplifying that a bit, we get Q plus Q plus QD over square root of two equals zero. And then what? If we want to find the charge of location D, what else do we need to do here? I'm not really sure. Well, algebraically, how would you solve for QD? So I'd subtract the two the the two Qs on the on the left side, so it'd be negative two Q, and then I'd multiply radical two. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Then it would be yeah, and I'd multiply the square of two by the two Q. Yeah. So negative two root two times Q. In other words, charge D has to be two root two times as big as either of the other charges, and also has to be a negative charge to cancel out the existing voltage. <clears throat> and that's ultimately because a positive charge creates positive voltage or tries to create positive voltage in the region around itself. So we need a negative charge, which tries to create negative voltage in the region around itself to balance that out. And since it's further away, it needs to be a stronger amount of charge to have the same effect. So it looks like that's what charge D has to be to make this work. Any questions on that so far? No, that was good, thank you. And then I think in the next part where we just trying to find the electric field at location A. Yeah, the net electric field vector. Okay, so let's try that out as well. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we want to find the electric field at location A. And we now know the charges involved. We can, in fact, we can go ahead and fill this in. This is negative two root two Q.
Uh, so let's figure out the electric field. Move this aside. And for electric field, that's a electric field is a vector. So we're going to need to consider the vector contribution from each charge individually and then add those up. For example, for charge C, C is going to create electric field at A in which direction? It's going to push it up. Yeah, C creates upwards electric field at location A. And I'd be careful about using words like push here because A is an empty point in space. There's nothing at A that we care about. It's just an empty point in space when we're trying to find the electric field at that location. So I would say C creates upwards electric field at that lo at location A. So this would be the electric field contribution caused by charge C, which we could just write as E sub C for now. And can we figure out how strong that contribution is? What's your usual formula for electric field caused by a point source? Is it just um what about that like Is it Q E? Uh well that's the formula for force. If you already know the electric field. Force is sort is test charge times electric. Right. Is it K? Yeah. Okay. Is it the KQ divided by R squared? Yeah, that should work. The universal constant K times the source charge divided by the distance squared. In this case, we know the distance is one meter. The charge is just called Q for now. And uh, K will just leave as K. So K times Q divided by one meter squared. In other words, K times Q. And there's also units of divided by meters squared. So that's the electric field contribution caused by C. And what about caused by B? Looks like that's the same distance and the same charge, but what's gonna be different? It's, uh, from A, it's going to be pointing to the left. Yeah, B creates electric field to the left at location A. So there's the electric field caused by, or the contribution to the electric field caused by B. And that'll also be KQ over meters squared, just in a different direction. And what about the contribution caused by charge D? Which direction would that be? It'll be like pointing towards charge D. Yeah, negative source charges create electric field towards themselves rather than away like positive charges do. So we're gonna have electric field pointing down into the right straight towards charge D. And to figure out that one, we go back to the equation. We have uh, K times the charge two root two Q. And I would ignore the, the negative sign here. If we're looking at for magnitude, magnitude should be interpreted as absolute value from the start. So I would think of it as magnitude of electric field is K times absolute value of charge of the source divided by distance squared. The negative does influence the direction, but it doesn't influence the magnitude, which is what we're looking for here. So K times the charge divided by the distance squared. And if you simplify that a bit, what do you get? What do you get if you square square root of two? Just two. Right. We've also got a times two in the numerator. So those are going to cancel out. And what's left? Just square root two. Yeah. And also the K and the Q. So yeah. root two k q and also a divided by meters squared <clears throat> so that'll be the electric field contribution caused by d 
Any questions on that so far? So far, so good. So next we want to find the total electric field at point A by adding these together. So how do we add vectors like this? If we know their directions and their magnitudes, what should we do in order to add them together? Don't we just, I mean, if we have, we could just use the head to tail method, I guess. Yeah, geometrically, we could put them together head to tail. We just pick some starting point and we want to add uh, EB plus EC. So we're, we're essentially taking some, let me actually mark the starting point here. We're choosing arbitrarily a starting point. From that starting point, we follow EB. From that as our new starting point, we follow EC. And from that as our new starting point, we follow ED. Kind of looks like that brings us back to our starting point, which suggests the sum should be what value? That should be zero. Yeah. Geometrically, it looks like these add up to zero. Now, it can kind of be difficult to tell if that's really accurate or not, because uh, this is just sort of a rough sketch in terms of the picture. So we should also check by adding them together numerically. We've got EB to the right, EC straight up, and ED on the diagonal. How can we add those together numerically and make sure? I know you'd use like, like the components in trigonometry, but I just don't know how to go by it. Yeah, let's try splitting those into components. Uh, we've got EB, EC, and ED. Uh, it looks like EB is straight to the left. So what does that tell you about its components? That it just has an X component. Right. So that means its magnitude is its X component. It's KQ over M squared to the left and no Y component at all. However, since it's to the left, how should we treat that as an X component? Uh, negative. Yeah. So negative KQ over M squared comma zero. It has no Y component at all. What about EC since it's straight up? It has no X component, but it has a Y component. Right. So that'll be just zero, comma. And since it's up, that'll be positive, KQ over M squared. And for D, we're actually going to need to split it up trigonometrically. We know its magnitude. And we want to find its X and Y components. So an X component and a Y component. Uh, also, what do we know about the angle here? It's a square. So mm -hmm. each angle is like 90 degrees, but if we, but when we like draw that to split them, it'd be mm -hmm. 45. So, it's, yeah. it's a so 40, that's a 45, 45 degree 45. angle. Right. So we could use right triangle trigonometry and use sine of 45 and cosine of 45. But there's also another uh, convenient approach we could use. We can compare this triangle. Let me actually label the sides here. Let's call these EDX and EDY as the X and Y components. Another thing we can do here that's often very convenient <coughs> is set up another triangle that's proportional to it. If we take a look at the square itself, if we draw in the diagonal and these two sides, this triangle of distances is exactly, or not congruent, but similar to the triangle of forces and X and Y components because they have matching angles. These are all 45 degree angles. These triangles are similar because their angles match up. And that tells us the sides have to be proportional. And what do we know about the sides of this distance triangle? That they're the same? Uh, the two legs are the same, yeah. Specifically, how long are they? They're, what was it, one meter? Yeah, one meter. So we can set up a proportionality. Anytime you've got similar triangles, you can bypass the entire idea of sine and cosine and tangent 
and just say the ratio of, let's say, leg to hypotenuse of this one is the same as the ratio of leg to hypotenuse of this one. So we can write that as, let's say, leg over hypotenuse, EDX over ED equals leg over hypotenuse of this one, one meter over square root of two meters. Meters are gonna cancel out. So that means the ratio of EDX over ED, the magnitude has to be one over root two. We know ED, so how would you solve for EDX here? We just um, we just multiply ED by the other side. Yeah, if we just multiply both sides by ED, we get EDX equals ED times one over root two. And we know ED. We can fill in ED root two kq over a meter squared. Divide that by root two, and what do you get? Uh, just kq. Yeah, KQ. and also divided by meters Me squared. Meter squared, yeah. So filling that in, we get EDX equals KQ over meter squared. Uh, and that's to the right, so we'll treat that as positive. Also, since this is a 45, 45, 90 triangle, EDY is going to be the same length, it's just downwards. So how would we treat that? Wait, could you repeat the question? I didn't hear it. That we know EDY is the same length because this is an isosceles triangle, 45, 45, 90 but it's downwards, so what does that tell us? Oh, it's negative? Yeah. So we can write ED in components as X component of positive KQ per meter squared and a Y component of negative KQ per meter squared. And at that point, we now have the each of these vectors written in terms of X, Y components. If we add those together, get the total electric field, what do we get? You just get zero, zero. Yeah, looks like the X components cancel out, the Y components cancel out. So we really do get zero, zero. So that would be the electric field at location A. It really does become zero, everything cancels out. What that tells us is if we were to put a test charge at location A, it would experience a zero force. A zero electric field times any test charge equals zero force. Any other questions on that? I got it. Thank you. Cool. Sounds good. <clears throat> um, anything else anyone wants to work on? Okay. So in this case, uh, we've got Andre and Eric. Andre is listening to an 80 hertz sound from his own radio. But he also hears another car that's also producing an 80 hertz sound. Because uh, it says he's also blasting the same song on his radio. So it looks like both of these cars are producing 80 hertz. But he doesn't hear an 80 hertz sound. He hears 81.25 hertz. And why is that? Because there's a beat. Yeah, we've got a beat frequency thing here. So he's really hearing two sounds. He's hearing an 80 hertz sound from his own car. <clears throat> and he's hearing some other sound from the other car. And we know that the uh, the carrier frequency, the frequency he actually hears is 81.25 hertz. So how are the two frequencies he's listening to going to relate to the carrier frequency he actually hears? They're going to be the average. Yeah. So we know that the average of 80 hertz and something is 81.25 hertz. So what would be another sound, another frequency, such that 80 hertz and something average to 
Yeah, it should be 82.5 because 81.25 is exactly halfway between those. So 82.5 is the sound he's hearing from the other car. So he hears an 82.5 hertz sound from the other car. But that's not the car, that's not the sound the other car is actually producing. The other car is producing what sound? Hey, what did you say? Uh, what's the sound that Eric's car is actually producing? Isn't it 80? 1.25? Uh, nobody's actually producing an 81.25 hertz sound. That's just the average that Andre hears. Because Andre is listening to an oh. 80 hertz sound from his own car. And he's listening to what sounds like 82.5 hertz from the other car. But what's the frequency the other car is actually creating? Eighty-two point five. That's what he hears. But note that it says that Eric's car is also blasting the same song. If Eric's car is playing the same song, what frequency is Eric's car actually producing? Um, 80 hertz. Yeah, Eric's car radio is producing an 80 hertz sound. But Andre hears it as 82.5 hertz because what's going on here? Why would he hear a different sound than what's being produced? Because um, you're having beats. Uh, the beats are just from hearing different sounds, but why is it a different sound in the first place? Why would you hear a sound that's different from what's actually being produced? What are the cars doing that's going to make the sound seem different? Are they interfering? Uh, the interference is what caused the beats in the first place. But the thing is, now that we know the sound that Eric's car is producing and the sound that Andre hears, 82.5 hertz, we can really ignore the sound that Andre's car is producing completely from now on. We can just look at the sound that Eric's car is producing versus the sound that Andre hears from it. This is ultimately a Doppler effect thing, that we've got the source that's creating the sound in motion that is Eric's car, which is producing the sound, is moving. And Andre, who is listening to the sound, is also moving. So he's hearing a different sound from what's being produced because of the Doppler effect. Okay. So if we go back to the Doppler effect, uh, using the same equation that we were looking at before, frequency observed equals frequency of the source times uh, this multiplier, which was what? Speed of sound plus or minus, is that speed of the observer in the numerator? And speed of sound plus or minus speed of the source in the denominator. So in this case, uh, how fast is the observer going? Um, ten meter per second. Yeah, we're treating Andre as the observer. He's moving at ten meters per second. So the speed of the observer is ten meters per second. Whereas Eric is being treated as the source, and we don't know how fast he's going. Also, what sound is the what frequency is the is the source producing? The source is Eric, right? Yeah. Because Eric is Eric's car is creating a sound and Andre is listening to that sound. So what's the frequency of the sound that Eric's car is producing? Eighty? Yeah. Eric's car is producing an eighty hertz sound. But Andre hears it as what? Eighty two point five. Right. So we know the speed of the observer and the frequency that the observer hears 
We also know the frequency that the source is producing, but we don't know the speed that the source is moving at. So if we fill those in, uh, we've got frequency of the source, 80, frequency observed, 82.5. Uh, speed of the observer, 10 meters per second. Speed of the source, unknown. Speed of sound, are we using 340 for that? Did it tell us? The speed of sound. Uh, let's use 340 for consistency since we were using 340 earlier. So 340 meters per second for speed of sound. <clears throat> and also we need to decide whether we're going to use plus or minus. Let's take a look at Andre's motion, for instance. Andre is moving away from the source. Would you expect that to mean that he's going to hear a higher or lower sound? He's going to hear a lower sound. Yeah. In other words, a decreased frequency. And if we want to decrease, should we use plus or minus in the numerator to make the result smaller? Minus. Yeah. So filling that in, 340 minus 10. And also Eric's car, the source is moving towards him. So would you expect that motion to lead to a higher or lower sound? Minus? Uh, yeah, because if the source is moving towards the observer, the waves get bunched together so you hear a higher sound. Mm -hmm. And yeah, subtracting in the denominator, that makes the denominator smaller, which makes the result larger. So we want to use minus in the denominator as well in this case. And ultimately, what are we trying to solve for here? Um... What's our goal? Oh, we're trying to find the velocity of Eric. Yeah, in other words, the variable V sub S. Uh, so let's simplify this a little bit first. This 80 Hertz here, I'm gonna divide both sides by 80 Hertz. So 82.5 divided by 80. And that way Hertz's and Hertz's cancel out. So we're just gonna get unitless 82.5 over 80 equals and then in the numerator, 340 minus 10 would be 330. And then the denominator, 340 meters per second minus Vs. So how do you deal with a variable in a denominator like this? Um, of course, multiply. Uh, you could, but actually a much easier way to do that. Instead of cross multiplying, you could get the variable to the denominator by just raising both sides to the negative one power. Um, you can just say this side, the negative one power, and this side, the negative one power. In other words, invert both fractions. Mm -hmm. So I would generally do that as a next step. Inverting both fractions means you get 80, over 82.5 equals 340 meters per second minus speed S, speed of the source, divided by 330. And that way, to get, to get Vs by itself, what do you need to do to get rid of the 330? Um. What's the opposite of dividing by 330? Um, you multiply 330 by both sides. Yeah, multiply both sides by 330. So you get 80 times 330 meters per second 
divided by 82.5 equals 340 meters per second minus speed S. And then what else do you still need to do? How would you so get rid of that? Yeah, if you just subtract 340. Yeah, the size. And you still have a negative on the V sub S, but that's going to be negative 340 meters per second minus or mm -hmm. plus 80 times 330 over 82.5 meters per second. Then we can just multiply both sides by negative one, and that'll turn the negative into a positive and turn the positive into a negative. So 340 minus 80 over 82.5 times 330. Let's see what that is. 340 minus 80 times 330 over 82.5. I'm getting about 20, or actually exactly 20. So VS is 20 meters per second. So that's the speed that Eric's car has to be going to make this happen. Any other questions on that? No. Right. Or any other questions in general? OK, with these three charges here? Yeah, that one. And we specifically are told that charge A experiences no net force from the other two charges. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be useful to look at this in terms of electric field. If you know that the that A is experiencing no net force, what does that tell you about the electric field at this location? It's there. Yeah. This means that at uh, A's location, the electric field is zero. And this ultimately goes back to the definition, force equals charge times electric field. If you have a charged object, the only way for force to be zero is if the electric field is zero. So we can actually proceed by ignoring force entirely. We can just say, ignoring charge A, if we just treat A as an empty point in space, we can just say, at this location, the electric field is zero. So that's what I would recommend in cases like this. If you want an object to have no force, a charged object to have no force, just treat that location in space as having zero electric field. Mm -hmm. So let's assume that the electric field here is zero. Specifically the net electric field. As we know these charges B and C are creating electric field at this location, we just need to ensure that they add up to zero. For example, if you consider charge B, Charge B is a negative charge, so it's going to create electric field in which direction here? Um, to the left? Not in this case. It's a negative charge, and a negative source charge creates electric field pointing inwards towards itself. So at this location, towards B means to the right. OK. In general, any negative source charge creates electric field going inwards towards itself. Any positive source charge creates electric field going outwards away from itself. So the electric field in this general region of, <coughs> general region of space around B is going to be field lines pointing inwards towards itself. And at a location to the, le to the left of it, that means electric field towards the right, towards the source charge. And we can also figure out how strong it is. The electric field from B, we can use that formula we were looking at earlier, KQ over R squared, specifically K times charge B divided by radius from B squared. Uh, but we want to cancel that out. We don't want an electric field at all. We want it to be zero. So we also need C to create its own electric field contribution in which direction? Mm. To the left? Yeah, we need electric field from C pointing to the left. 
so that they can add up to zero. And ignoring everything else for the moment, ignoring what's going on in between, if C creates electric fields to the left, what kind of charge does C have to be? Positive. Yeah, C has got to be a positive charge, so it creates electric field going outwards, away from itself. So we know C has to have positive charge. So with that in mind, we now know what kind of charge C has to be based on the direction. We can also figure out how much charge based on the magnitudes of the vectors. Because if two vectors add up to zero, their directions have to be opposite. And what should we assume about their magnitudes? They're the same. Yeah. Let's assume that magnitude of electric field caused by B is equal to magnitude of electric field caused by C. <clears throat> For each one of those, we can use the KQ over R squared formula. So K times, and I'm going to put charge B in absolute value, because for magnitude, we should ignore sign entirely. K times how much charge B has, regardless of sign, divided by, and then how, what's the radius for charge B to the location of interest? And which one is the charge of interest? Uh, well, the, the location we care about is location A. We want to, we, we're looking at the electric field at that location. So from B to A, that'll be 10 centimeters, right? Yeah, so we've got 10 centimeters squared because it's radius squared in the formula. So mm -hmm. K times charge B divided by the radius squared. And we can set that equal to K times charge C divided by what radius would that be from C to the location we care about? 30. Yeah, so that'll be 30 centimeters squared. <clears throat> and which one of these charges are we trying to solve for? The what charge for C. Yeah, we want to solve for charge C. So to isolate charge C, How would you isolate that? Are you going to multiply both sides by 30 squared? Yeah. And also, we want to get rid of this k. So what would you do with that? You divide both sides by k. Yeah. So let's do both of those in one step. We will multiply both sides by. 30 centimeters squared, and also divide both sides by K. The Ks are going to cancel out on both sides. K and K cancel out, K and K cancel out. On the right side, the 30 centimeters squared and 30 centimeters squared also cancel out. So it looks like all that's left is absolute value of charge C equals absolute value of charge B times 30 centimeters squared. And we still have divided by 10 centimeters squared. And when we divide those, what's going to happen? Is that nine? Yeah, that's just going to be nine because 30 over 10 is three squared is nine. So that means the absolute value of charge C is the same as the absolute value of charge B times nine. C is going to be nine times as much charge as B because it's three times as far away and the distance gets squared. So three times as far away means you need nine times as much charge to balance it out. So that's where the nine comes in in this case. So we can just take charge B, multiply by nine, and make it positive instead of negative, and that'll be charge C.
Any questions on that one? Wait, why didn't we just plug in the value for charge B as minus six times nine raised to the power? I mean, 10 raised to the power minus nine. What do you mean? Oh, why we, why didn't we plug in the minus six times 10 raised to the power minus nine for QB? Yeah, that's what we do. We take that charge, multiply by nine to get the charge on C. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah okay. That but also, sense. so that six times nine would be 54, but positive, because we know C is a positive charge. So C would be positive 54 times 10 to the negative nine. Okay, so um, for the B part, do you use the charge you found from here? And then what do you use for the E? That's what I'm confused about for the B part. Uh, yeah, we're now taking it. We want to find the force experienced by charge B. So, so far we've been treating B and C as the source charges and A as a, just a location in space. But in part B, mm -hmm. it's saying we're looking at a force experienced by charge B. So that means we're going to, that from this point onward, we're now going to be treating B as the test object. And if we want to find the charge on object B, what I would do is start by treating B as an empty location in space. So if we just treat B as a location in space, we can find the electric field at location B. And if we know the electric field at location B, we can multiply by the charge of object B to get the force on object B. So that's generally what I would do in a case like this. If you want to find the force acting on some charge, ignore the charged object itself. Just figure out these, the electric field at that location. And then once you know the electric field, multiply by the test charge, and that'll tell you the force. And we can now do that because we know the charges of both other objects. We know C is 54 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs. And we know A is negative six times 10 to the negative nine coulombs. And we know both distances. So you can use KQ over R squared to find the electric field each one of these causes, add them together with vector addition to find the total electric field, and then multiply that electric field by charge of object B to find the force on object B. Any questions on that one so far? So, uh... I'm still confused on how to get the E. <laughs> the electric field? Yeah. We can use the exact same formula. The uh, electric field magnitude anyway. Magnitude of the electric field equals K times absolute value of charge divided by radius squared. So for instance, if you take a look at object A, object A is 10 centimeters away from location B. So we can take K times the charge, six times 10 to the negative nine coulombs, times 10 centimeter or divided by 10 centimeters squared. Although we'd probably want to convert that to meters in this case. <coughs> and the previous one, we didn't need to convert to meters because the centimeters cancel out anyway. But in this case, we'll want meters to match up with K, which has meters in it. <coughs> also, if we're talking about charge A, that's a negative charge. So what's the direction of the electric field it creates at location B? Wait, but B is also negative. So is it going towards A or B? Well, the great thing about electric field is we don't have to care about the test charge. We're talking about oh. the electric field caused by charge A. So ignoring everything else in the universe, you just have negative charge at location A. That's going to create electric field towards A or away from A. Towards A. Yeah. So at location B, we have an electric field to the left caused by charge A. So this would be electric field contribution caused by charge A. And then what about C? C is a positive charge, so it's going to create electric field in which direction? Um, away from C. Yeah. So away from C is going to mean also to the left.
So both of the electric field contributions are to the left. Those are going to combine to a very strong electric field to the left. And we can calculate how strong they are using KQ over R squared. So EA, for instance, is going to be K times Q, 6 times 10 to the negative 9, divided by R, which is a tenth of a meter squared. Good. And K is the universal constant, which you can look up. I would just leave it as K for now and fill in the value at the very end because everything is going to have a K in it here. Uh, what about for EC? Um, KQ over 20 square. Yeah. And Q here is going to be 54 times 10 to the negative 9. And 20 centimeters, we'll want to convert that to meters also, so 0 0.2 meters squared. Mm -hmm. So simplify those. And again, I would just write it in terms of K for now. But simplify so are you going to add them up? When you, Sorry, what was that? When you, when you find the E for A towards B and C towards B, are you going to add them up? Yeah, well, I would say the that's the electric field from A at location B and the electric field from C at location B. And yeah, we would add those yeah. together to find the total electric field at location B. And that total electric field is E in the equation here. Once you find the total electric field, you can multiply that by charge, the actual charge of object B to find the force on object B. So wait, because um, I remember like a section in class we had to like square both sides. I don't know if that applies here. Sorry, where you have what? So when you add them up, do you have to like square with them? Uh, no, the vectors are in the same direction. So you can just add their components or add their values together. Oh, so you only square with the answers when you have like the X and Y components. Yeah, if you want to convert between X and Y components versus magnitude, you would use Pythagorean theorem. Oh, okay. And this is essentially a one dimensional problem. All the electric fields are just to the left or to the right. So there's no need to use trigonometry to split it up into components. Uh, any other questions on that so far? Um, no. So add those, simplify those, add them together. That tells you the total electric field, which is to the left. But then you're going to multiply that by charge B, which is a negative charge. So the electric field, which you found, times the charge tells you the force. And the negative sign, what does a negative sign do to a vector? Um, wait, what do you mean? If you take a vector and you multiply it by a negative number, what does that do to the vector? What, what does that tell you about the result? Um, isn't it the, the direction? Yeah, it's just going to flip the direction. So you would still okay. list the amount of force as an absolute value. It's just going to be some positive number of Newtons. But the mm -hmm. fact that you're multiplying by a negative charge means the, the final result is going to be a force to the right. Because the electric field is pointing to the left, but you're multiplying by a negative charge. So the force is going to point to the right. That is, object B will experience a force to the right. And these calculations will tell you how much force. Any other questions on that? No, I kind of get it. Okay, so try that out, run through the calculations. Uh, and there, uh, there should be a lot of other practice problems on the other practice tests and the DLs that uh, should be pretty similar to this in terms of figuring out forces in electric fields. So we get some more practice and it, uh, it does become easier. With Any other questions on that? No, I can get it. Okay.
Yeah, um, I do have some questions on, from different practice exams. Okay. So we know the wavelength that the light has to begin with. It hits an electron and then scatters and now has a different wavelength. And we're assuming that the, the wavelength, uh, the photon is changing because it has uh, transferred some energy to the electron. So let's take a look at before and after here. If we compare initial and final, we start off with an electron at rest. And we end with the same electron now moving at some unknown final speed. And meanwhile, we had, uh, the reason this happened is we had this, this photon of light hit the electron. That we had some light, which I'm just gonna draw as a squiggle. So this photon, it's the electron. And we know that it is, we know its original wavelength is two nanometers. And we also know that the wavelength, the, the photon, or at least a, a different photon possibly, exists afterwards with a slightly longer wavelength. So after the wavelength is now 2.18 nanometers. So the photon has changed in the process of get, allowing the electron to get faster. Any questions on that so far? No. So we could look at this in terms of conservation of energy. Before we've got a, a photon with a certain amount of energy, after we've got a photon with a certain amount of energy and the electron now has some kinetic energy. The photon has lost energy, the electron has gained energy. So do you know how to figure out the energy that a photon has? Isn't it um, HC over lambda equals E? Yeah, energy of the photon is HC over lambda. Uh, HC is 1240 electron nanometers, or sorry, 1240 electron volt nanometers. divided by two nanometers. So we just get uh, 620. So that's how much energy the photon had at the beginning. I guess it should be electron volts. And then in the final situation, we can figure out the final amount of energy it has. The electron has still HC over lambda. So that's 1240 electron volt nanometers divided by 2.18 nanometers. So 1240, have... sorry, what was that? I said, um, if we did it, like, why do we have to do it separately? What if we did like um, 2.18 minus two equals 0 0.8 as a delta L? Uh, well, none of the formulas involve delta wavelength. There's no conservation of wavelength. What we care about is change in energy. If we actually wrote out the conservation of energy equation here, uh, delta E total equals zero for the whole system. That would be change in energy of the photon plus change in kinetic energy of the electron equals zero. Uh, but what's the formula for energy of a photon? HC over lambda. Right. So if we wrote out HC over lambda final minus HC over lambda initial, 
you could factor out the HC, but what's left is not lambda final minus lambda initial. It's one over lambda final minus one over lambda initial. So you could work this out as one over 2.18 minus one over two, but that's not the same as 2.18 minus two. So it's really the fact that lambda is in the denominator that means we can't just subtract lambdas. Any other questions on that so far? No. And you could write it out like this. You could subtract one over 2.18 minus one over two, simplify that and then multiply that by HC. Uh, but I think it might be easier in this case to just calculate the energy before and the energy after. Like the 1240 divided by 2.18 is about 568.8. And these are in electron volts, which is a unit of energy. We, can, we might need to convert that to joules later, but we can do that separately. Uh, so the energy, the change in energy of the photon, we could just write that as final minus initial. So that's 568.8 electron volts minus 620 electron volts. And meanwhile, for the kinetic energy of the electron, we can write that as, what's our usual formula for kinetic energy? Half mv squared. Yeah, half of m. And then since we're looking at change, that's delta v squared. And similarly, this is not just uh, final speed minus initial speed, it's final speed squared minus initial speed squared. So that'll be V final squared minus the initial squared. But what do we know about the initial speed of the electron? It's zero. Yeah, the electron at the beginning was not moving. So initial speed is zero. And simplifying a bit, 568.8 minus 620 would be negative 50.2. A negative 51.2, I guess. So, so that means the photon is losing 51.2 electron volts of energy. And that means the electron is gaining 51.2 electron volts of kinetic energy. Likewise, for the electron, we've got half the mass times V final squared minus zero squared. So that's just V final squared. And then what else could we do here? What are we trying to find in this case? The velocity. Yeah. So how would you isolate V final here? Um, 51.2 equals minus N2, N over two times Vf squared. Yeah, well, without the minus though, because this is already negative. So we'd be adding 51.2 to both sides. Yeah. So add 51.2 to both sides. And then what else would we still need to do? Divide both sides by m over two to isolate the vf square. Yeah. Which really means multiplying by two and dividing by m. So multiplying by two, make this 102.4 divided by mass, and that's specifically mass of the electron. And then one last step, how would we isolate V final? Squared put sides. Yeah, take the square root. And so you've got a little more work to do here. This is, this is measured in electron volts. 
you really want this to be in joules so that when you divide by kilograms, it becomes meters squared per second squared and then meters per second. So you'll need to convert electron volts to joules. And also you'll need to know the mass of the electron. So you'll need to look that up as well. But once you've got electron volts converted to joules and mass of the electron written in kilograms, divide those, mm -hmm. take the square root, and that'll be the final speed. Oh, okay. Any other questions on that so far? No. And then for the electron itself, in part B, it's asking what's the wavelength of the electron. Uh, and it gives you a hint about momentum, mass times velocity. Do you remember how momentum is related to wavelength? Mm, H divided by P. Yeah. According to the de Broglie relationship, uh, wavelength of some particle, the effective wavelength is Planck's constant divided by momentum. So using the mass of the electron and the final speed you calculate in part A, multiply those to get the momentum of the electron, and then Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the electron is the effective wavelength of the electron. Any other questions on that one? No. Right. I've got to get going, uh, but good luck on finals, and I will see you later.